How many of y'all been enjoying our journey through this as we looked at some kind of uh, misquoted phrases that people believe are biblical, not just phrases, but also uh, systems of belief and thought, and we found them, some of them, to not be true. So we're going to finish this today, and then we are going to, obviously, next week is Easter. Can you believe next week is Easter? Some of y'all excited? Anybody excited for Easter? All right, I was going to say, church folk, y'all should be excited for Easter. Last time I checked, a dead God means that faith has no, you know, has no meaning. So Jesus rose from the grave, and we should celebrate that. And so we're excited about that. So um, I hope that you guys are using your invites and inviting people uh, in, uh, to church next week, and we look forward to seeing what God is going to do. Now, in this series that we've been in, the Bible doesn't say that. We have been looking at erroneous beliefs and phrases about God and Christianity that have uh, snuck their way into the modern church culture. Popular phrases or way of this, ways of thinking that are in direct conflict with the Bible, even though people believe, believe them to actually be biblical. And so we've been looking at what the Bible actually says about some of these things in comparison to what people think. And some of these statements that we have looked at are really kind of half-truths. Some of them are half-taught in the Bible. And so that's what lends themselves to people believing them, even though they are inaccurate. So last week, we looked at the idea of obedience always leads to financial blessing. Don't we wish that was the case? The system, this system of belief is really a product of what we uh, call the prosperity gospel. And we talked a little bit last week about the dangers of the prosperity gospel. And, uh, and we saw that this statement simply is not true. When the Apostle Paul teaches us, as we looked at Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, that contentment really is the goal of the Christian life. That God promises that he will always provide our needs. He never promises excess. Sometimes he does give us excess, but all he promises is that he'll provide our needs and that we are to be content with every blessing that he gives us. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean financial blessing. And contentment, we saw, is a gift from God. That was our one true statement. Contentment is a gift from God. It's something that we can only learn through Christ. Because it's countercultural to experience this idea of contentment, especially in a culture that is always striving for the next thing, right? So today we're going to finish off this series, and I want you all to put your thinking caps on with me today. So go ahead, put your thinking caps on, all right? Of course, the adults don't want to participate, you know, so that's okay. We're going to talk a little theology today. Y'all excited about talking a little theology? If I go a little deep today, okay, on you, okay? So I need y'all to track along with me. We're going to hit some scriptures. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to get all up in the text today, okay? So uh, because we're going to talk about something that is very, very important and can be generally misunderstood, okay? We're going to finish this series by tackling probably a very controversial phrase. Do not judge others. Have anybody heard that phrase before? Oh, well, only God judges me or do not judge me or da 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 this and that. Something to that effect, right? Now, that phrase is often levied at Christians by unbelievers, right? Unbelievers often say, well, don't be trying to judge me or whatever the case may be. And honestly, we're going to look at from the Apostle Paul, they're right. They're actually right to a degree, and we're going to see how they are right when Paul actually encourages us that we're too busy looking at the outside world when we need to look inside first. We're too busy looking at the outside world, judging them when God is the one who judges them, when judgment needs to happen in God's house first. And so we're going to see how this is uh, a little bit different than what we may think on the surface. So the purpose for today's sermon is to lay out a biblical groundwork for dealing with the issue of sin within the church in order for the church members as individuals to be healthy and also the church itself to be healthy. Okay? So that's going to be our goal. And we got a lot to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in. Now, if I asked you, what is the primary purpose of a hospital? Now, the primary purpose of a hospital is not to look pretty. The primary purpose of a hospital is not to, you know, uh, it's the primary purpose of a hospital, the reason you go there is to get better, right? If it doesn't matter all the other stuff, all the other stuff is ancillary, that's the most important measure of a hospital is if people actually go in and get better. Not its beauty, <clears throat> Robert Wood Johnson, just, just saying. 
Because some hospitals are not the prettiest places. Now, if you go to Capital Health, looks like you've been inside a hotel. You know what I mean? Now, the friendliness of staff, even though it's important, it's not the most important thing, or it's sophisticated equipment. The measure of a hospital is its ability to make hurting people feel better. If you don't feel better, then you aren't going to go to that hospital. If you don't get good care at that hospital and didn't come out feeling better, you're going to tell your friends they ain't going to want to go to that hospital either. Now, the measure of the hospital is the ability to make them feel better. If a hospital doesn't do that, then everything else is a waste of time. It doesn't matter how pretty the facility is. The church is God's spiritual hospital. It's called upon to open its doors to people who are sick. People who are sick because of sin, addictions, burdens, hurts, conflicts, whatever. Insert your symptom, okay? Everybody's welcome into the church because it's God's hospital. That means that people who are pastors and leaders are essentially like appointed physicians of the soul under the care of the great physician. So my role is like being a physician under his care, okay, under the care and the authority of the great physician. Now, if a physician diagnoses a disease in your body and the test shows that you're suffering on a natural level from a malignant tumor, don't get mad at the physician. All the physician did was expose you to what was lying underneath the surface. And then the physician may suggest that we need to operate to remove the tumor. Now, no matter how mad you might be at the news, the best course of action is to remove the tumor. Now, I am fully convinced that some people want to come to church, but they don't want to be operated on. They want to hear doctors talk about their situation or talk about the world in general, anything, but they do not want to go into surgery. They don't want to allow God to do heart surgery on them. Surgery is not pleasant. In fact, any, how many of y'all ever had surgery before? Right? Some of y'all had multiple surgeries probably, right? Now, surgery, it's not necessarily pleasant because after you actually get out of surgery, you may experience some very big discomfort for a while as you recover. And you wonder why you even had the surgery in the first place. But the purpose of the procedure is not to hurt but to heal. It eventually brings the healing even though it may not feel like it in the immediate moment. Now, sin is like a disease. It has to be treated. If it let, goes untreated, then what happens is that it eventually spreads. Our sin never just affects us, so sin spreads amongst those who are around us. But if we, if we use this hospital illustration, sin needs to be quarantined sometimes. And if it's not quarantined, then it could spread to the whole hospital. And if it spreads to the whole hospital and everybody is sick, then you got a problem. You have an epidemic at that, at that point, right? So here's my one true statement for you today. Accountability is necessary for the spiritual health of individuals and the church as a whole. Accountability is necessary for the spiritual health of individuals and the church as a whole. And we're going to see how that's a little bit different from the talking about judgment or the way that people perceive that idea. Okay? We're going to be in two passages this morning. So if you have your physical Bible or you want to follow along in the version app, you could. We're going to start off in 1 Corinthians 5, but also put your hand on Matthew 18, okay? We're going to go to Matthew 18 second, but we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 5, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to break down this idea of being able to deal with sin for our own personal health and for the health of the body of Christ for the local church, we're going to examine it from a medical perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of four steps to do that. Number one is we're going to talk about diagnosing it. Number two is we're going to talk about treatment. Number three is we're going to talk about the effects of the disease. And then number four is we're going to talk about where do we have surgery, okay? So we're going to talk about uh, diagnosis, treatment, effects, and where the surgery is to be performed, okay? So starting at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, let's look at the diagnosis, okay? Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, and it reads, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. Are you arrogant? Ought you not rather to mourn? Now, this is the Apostle Paul, and if you feel like that there's a bunch of new sin under the sun, just read the book of Corinthians. 
The book of Corinthians, the church at Corinth was messed up. They had some crazy stuff going on. They had this situation going on. They were taking each other to court. They were just having all kind of chaos in their services. There was all kind of craziness going on in the church in Corinth because these guys got radically saved out of paganism, but paganism hadn't really left them yet, okay? And so there's lots of crazy stuff going on in Corinthians. But before we actually jump into the significance of this text, I want to go ahead and make a disclaimer, if I could say, as to why the Apostle Paul addresses this so strongly. Because we're going to read this thing and say, man, he's really, really strong in what he's saying. But the reason why is because, why is Paul called for discipline in this situation? Number one, it was public knowledge. This was a, everybody knew what was happening, what was happening in the church. Number two, it was consistent. It wasn't a one-time thing, but it was an ongoing relationship. Number three, it was unrepentant. The person, it was addressed by the church and people, and initially there was not repentance that took place. So in the eyes of those participating, there was nothing wrong with this behavior, so much so that Paul makes this statement in verse one, basically saying he's repulsed by the idea that people actually think it's cool. That's what he's saying, that people think it's cool what's going on. Paul's horrified about the news that a man is essentially having an inappropriate relationship with his stepmother. I don't know about you, that may not shock people today. It still should shock us, but I'm, but I'm saying, but still, it, it's horrifying to Paul as essentially like the church father of this church. He's morally repulsed by what's going on. He says they should be so ashamed that even people who are pagans, non-Christians, turn their eyes to what is going on. And everybody else is like, yay, yay. And they could care less about what's going on. The word translated immorality in this passage is a generic one, which includes all various subcategories of the word. It's a basically an umbrella statement that talks about every kind of unlawful uh, sexual expression. It's an umbrella statement that covers all of it, okay? Now, Paul is really, really disgusted because not, not only because of what is happening, but because of the attitude of the church. The attitude is as bad or even worse than the sin that actually took place. Their willingness to accept what is going on. And that's why he says, are you arrogant? Are you not rather to mourn about what is going on rather than be cheerful and just accepting of what is going on? Let's take this home. The proper response to sin always in the life of the believer is to be one of mourning and repentance. We should never be comfortable with sin in our own personal lives. Repentance should be an ongoing, consistently occurring thing within your life. Because sin is the reason why your Savior died on a cross. Sin is the reason why your Savior needed to raise from the dead that we're going to celebrate next week and had to conquer sin. But sin not only does that, it's the reason why we need to experience salvation in the first place. But however, sin continuously separates us from God. The further and further along and the more that we cultivate or the more that we put up with sin in our personal life, we will end up finding ourselves further and further and further and further away from God as we continue to naturally drift away. It's not something we should ever, ever play with. Has your sin ever broken you? Have you been so broken over your own personal sin at time that literally it just causes you to weep? No matter how long you've been a Christian, one of the most honest things you can ever pray is to ask God to reveal the wickedness of your own heart. Because you know what? No matter how long you've been a Christian, it's like when God deals with one thing, then all of a sudden a situation comes up, something within you really ugly that you didn't even realize is there beneath the surface, and God is bringing it up to the surface. And when God brings it up to the surface, it should break us. It should break us because we want nothing to separate us from God. We'll never grow in our relationship with Christ if we neglect to recognize that we are accountable to him. Didn't David say, against you and only you I have sinned, the psalmist? He acknowledged his accountability before God first, and he was broken over his sin. Unfortunately, sin has become a taboo word that people don't really like to talk about much, but it is necessary to deal with sin in order for a church to be spiritually healthy and in order for you as an individual to be spiritually healthy. Let's look at the next step. 
So once we diagnose what's going on, Paul immediately calls out what is going on. And he calls it for what it is. He's calling it sin. The next thing is that, well, we got to treat this thing. We got to get rid of it. Let's talk about the treatment plan. Verse 2. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if I am present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Paul is going to charge the church four times in this small passage to remove this person. Now, that doesn't really sound like something that's very typical, right? He's literally saying, for the health and overall well-being of the church, get this guy out of here. And you're going to see why. If we think of the church as a hospital, and I want you to keep that in your, your minds this whole time, right? If we think of the church as a hospital, and, and people come into the hospital because they are sick, what benefit would it be to you if you were just to leave out sick? God has no intention of bringing you to himself to keep you comfortable in your sin. Literally, he has no intention of doing that. I can tell you right now, I'm going to give you all an out, okay? If you're a person here under the sound of my voice today who has not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and thinking and doing so that God is not going to ask you to change. He does it, but he demands you do. Don't make a decision to try to follow Jesus then. God isn't going to leave us comfortable in our own spiritually sick state, making us somehow feel good about our sin. Absolutely not. You come into the hospital, you get treated. You're going to get treated by hearing the word of God. You're going to get treated, hopefully, in the context of relationships and accountability. You're going to get treated by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin, all these various different things. But the funny thing is the church was very hesitant to try and bring discipline because Paul wasn't physically there. The hammer, if I could say it that way, it was like the hammer wasn't there. So since Paul's not there, everybody was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. But Paul had all the information he needed to know, and he said, this is what you would do. And this is what I would do if I was physically present with you as the spiritual leader of this church. The judgment has already been made. Paul made a judgment call, and he made a judgment call based upon a standard, God's standard, right? Now, at this point, many people, as I said, this statement is levied often against Christians by unbelievers. Many people will quote Matthew chapter 7, which Jesus says, literally red letters, it is Jesus. It says, do not judge so that you will not be judged, right? Now, if you read the rest of the context of what Jesus is saying, is Jesus really saying that under any circumstance whatsoever, that there is never supposed to be judgment that takes place? That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is clearly saying the manner in which that he was bringing to the attention of the people that were in the audience was that they were judging inappropriately. They were judging inappropriately as hypocrites. They were judging hypocrisy is a wrong form of judgment because it has a bad motivation of heart. Not only does it have a bad motivation of heart, calling like our brother and sister to the carpet to make ourselves feel big. That's why he said to have the log in your eye. You're trying to get a speck out, but you got a big two by four in your eye. But also hypocrisy, its goal is not restoration and repentance. Its goal is, ha ha, I got you. That's its goal. But that's not the goal, that's not the redemptive nature of accountability. That's different. It's not, ha ha, I got you. Hypocrisy is when we place ourselves in the authority and judge as if somebody who is perfect, when we ought to always first judge ourselves. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Before you ever think about making any judgment toward another, another person, you should very, 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 take this advice, look at yourself first. That's the biblical model. If not, you have a very high likely of being a modern day Pharisee and walking in hypocrisy. And we're going to talk about the matter of the heart. Paul's going to address that pretty strongly. Now, let me ask y'all a question. Would you all agree that immorality is a sin? How many of y'all agree immorality is a sin? Why are you judging me? Why are you judging anybody? How could you say immorality is a sin? The reason we say immorality is a sin is because we judge it against the standard, right? You made a judgment call. You morally made a judgment call. You said that this is sin, and I would venture to say the reason why, hopefully if you're here at a church and you raised your hand, 
about immorality. It's not a pragmatic reason. You raised your hand because God says it's wrong. Am I correct? Does God say it's wrong? Yes, he does. So since God says it's wrong, it's God's standard by which we are executing that judgment. Now, some people may be tempted to say, well, Pastor Pina, what does it matter? What he or she does, that's his business. That's not my business. That may be true in the world, but it's not true in the word. Hear me. When a Christian sins, it's not just their own business, and we understand this just on a natural level. We understand that if you live in the context of a family, we often talk about the church's family, right? Think about your family. I want you to think about your family unit right now. Whether or not it's just you as a single person, whether it's you as a married couple, you with your kids. If you're married and your spouse sins against you, they do something that is very, very wrong, and they do that against you, right? you just going to say, well, that's just their business. It's affected you, right? They sinned against you. It's affected you because you're a family. It happened in the, in the context of the family, right? Imagine if a loved one came up to you who has cancer, and you just said, well, that's your business. You know, I'm not going to encourage you to get treatment even though it's treatable. It's just your business. You can go to a hospital if you want to or not. If someone is hit by a car, would you say to them while they're lying in the ditch, Oh, that's just your business. I'm sorry. I can't help you. I don't want to interfere. That's not the way that families work. When one member of our family is in pain, all of us share that pain. That's how this church is supposed to work as a family of God. We all see that in the natural, but somehow we think that's different in the spiritual when there's lots of purposeful correlation to those things. Look at verse 4. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord, when y'all go to church, when you're all assembled in the name of the Lord, Jesus in my spirit is present, Paul, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan. Holy smokes. You're to deliver this dude to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But look at the reason why. You need to highlight that at the back. He didn't just say deliver him over to Satan. There's a reason so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's the reason behind it. So let's talk about the treatment plan. So what is the treatment plan, Pastor Pina's biblical treatment plan, as the physician diagnosing, right? What would be my prescription for restoring somebody back into fellowship within the context of our local local church that is dealing with their own personal sin? That really, the answer comes from this passage and also from Matthew 18. Okay, so now you can turn to Matthew 18. So I'm going to give you kind of a systematic approach, all right? So number one, pray. Number one, pray. Use this time to check your heart and motivation behind addressing sin with your brother In addition, prayer is important for us to receive wisdom and guidance from the Holy Spirit and how to handle a situation. Now, accountability happens in the context of relationships. Let me give you a perfect example of this. If you're a parent and some stranger, because maybe say you're in a public place and your kid's out of line or something, and some stranger comes up to you and just says, you need to discipline that kid. Here's what you do. Or, that, or the stranger, better yet, try to discipline your kid. What you going to do? <laughs> we about to throw. You ain't touching my kid, right? They don't have relationship. They don't have relational equity to be able to speak into your life, if I use that terminology, right? They don't have relational equity. So just anybody who's anybody can't just go around and say, well, you know, I'm Mr. Holier than now, and, you know, I know the Bible, and you need to get your life right with Jesus, and you need to do this. If they have no relational equity with you, uh uh-uh, that's not how it works. Number one, pray, all right? Here's number two. 
Matthew 18, 15. Now, Matthew 18 lays out how do you work this process through if you have conflict specifically with another individual and the conflict is unrepentant. It's an ongoing thing, okay? And so he's going to, Jesus literally walks out a process. Couple this together with 1 Corinthians 5, you basically have kind of the two main passages in dealing with interpersonal relationships and sin within the church, okay? Number two, go to your brother in private. Now, this could be, this is perfectly applicable to your family context as well, by the way. Don't go be blasting your stuff out on Facebook. Oh my goodness, I hate when people do that. Don't be airing out conflict, interpersonal conflict on Facebook. You look like a dummy. I'm just going to tell you, that just, that's not cool, all right? And that's never going to be productive, all right? Go to your brother in private. Restoration is not about humiliation. We are not to be vultures like praying on fallen Christians. We should, however, be like divine physicians, restoring those members who are out of joint with the body of Christ as relationally brothers and sisters in Christ, encouraging one another to holiness, to godliness. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, not with your prayer group under the guise of a prayer request. Nothing like that. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Galatians 6.1, brothers, if anyone is caught up in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of what? Gentleness. I love that word. In a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Here's the third thing. Take two or three witnesses. So step one doesn't work. If you go to that person, and this is in the context if they offended you, if there's some type of offense, you go to them and they don't want to hear you. They're like, get away from me. I ain't trying to hear that. Now you take some other people with you as well. If your brother did not receive you that first time, take two or three witnesses and address the issue again. Take objective witnesses and the objective is still restoration. That's still the objective, okay? Matthew 18, 16, but if he does not listen, take one or two among others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. The next step is to take it to the church. If your brother or sister still refuses to repent or address the issue, then it becomes an issue that the whole church deals with. And it becomes an issue because then it's affecting the family of God. Now this is not just an interpersonal thing. It is now basically become an issue because we've involved other witnesses. There's still not repentance going on. So we bring it to the whole church. So Paul speaks of this discipline process taking place when you are assembled. Now this step takes on different manifestations depending upon the church because some will bring the issue before like a church board. And some will bring it like in a church meeting context and bring it before everybody. Matthew 18, 17, the first part. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. The last step, what we call excommunication. This is the last step that Paul has in mind. In Matthew 18, 17, the latter part, it says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector, a.k.a. let him be to you like an unbeliever. And he basically lists Gentiles and tax collectors as what was seen as the worst of the worst by his listening audience. Okay? So let him be to you as if he's an unbeliever. 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 again, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, excommunication is not something we ever really talk about, but what does that actually mean? Excommunication is the practice of temporarily or permanently excluding somebody from the local church as punishment specifically for unrepented sin. Let me even insert this. That, is, uh, that has continuously been addressed. In this particular situation, it was addressed multiple times over and over again, still to the rejection Restoration did not take place, even though that's the goal. The goal is always restoration. And even in excommunication, we're going to see, as Paul says, he's going to eventually tell the church to receive this guy back because repentance takes place. 
Okay? The goal is still restoration. The goal isn't, ha ha, I got you. You're really bad and you're a continuous sinner and you keep on doing this, this, and that, so I don't want to deal with you and our church is going to throw you out and that's it. That's not what it's about. Excommunication is the final stage of the biblical process. This only happens when discipline fails to result in repentance and reconciliation. The process expels the unrepentant saint. It does not acknowledge them. They're not an unbeliever. This is talking to you, church. These are talking to believers. Paul's not going to say that the person's not a Christian. So to expel an unrepentant saint from the church, from participating in its worship and fellowship with individuals or small groups of believers, believers are no longer to associate with them until they have repented. In doing so, the saving saint not only loses the positive benefits of being part of a church body, but is placed in a very dangerous position of being vulnerable to Satan's attacks. This is very, very scary stuff because the church gives us a sense of protection as well and identity, and Christ is the head of the church. And what God is saying, it's been established by witnesses. This is continued unrepentant behavior. I'm going to allow that person to suffer the consequences for this sin, and I'm going to back you in removing them so it doesn't affect the whole, the protection of the whole, and now I'm releasing my hand of coverage over them. So that Satan has his reign on them. That's scary stuff. That's like scary stuff. But the goal, as Paul says, is that so his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The goal is that godly discipline would be redemptive. Parents. Imagine what your children would be like if you never executed discipline on them. You have to execute discipline on them, right? Sometimes you know better than they do. No matter how much they think they know better than you, do, than, than, how much they perceive that they know better than you, right? Sometimes you got to bring discipline. But the discipline is always for the purpose of redemption, right? It's redemptive. You may execute a punishment, but it's hopefully that they would learn the consequences of what took place, that they would do better the next time. And you still receive them, you still love them, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 through 8, we're not going to read it, but that's the passage where Paul literally tells the church to receive this guy back. Because repentance took place. Like the loving father he is, God disciplines in order to bring us back to him, and he uses the church at times to be the instrument of that discipline. Now that we thought about treatment, the question is then, well, then, pastor, does that, like, what, like, what sin qualifies for that? Like, if I break the speed limit, does that mean that I'm going to be brought before the church? I mean, like, if I, I don't know, if I, you know, sneeze in church at an inappropriate time or whatever, does that mean that I'm going to be brought before the church? We say that tongue in cheek, but for some people, this is like, you know, this is where it needs to be clearly defined, Okay. You got your thinking caps on with me again now? All right, so now we're going to clearly define this. Let's talk about things that the Bible specifically says need to be addressed in this manner. Number one, divisiveness. The church is a collection of people, but it's never about one person. A person who is self-centered disrupts the unity of the body of the church, and God always is vigilant to protect the unity of, the bo of his body. Okay? Two different visions equals division. So God is very, very protective over a, having a spirit of unity and not being divisive when people are divisive. Titus 3, 10, and 11. Mark those down for your own reading benefit. Number two is what we talked about in Matthew 18. When there's unresolved conflict between believers, when they can't settle the dispute, when we've walked through the whole process of Matthew 18 and it still becomes unresolved and unacknowledged. So Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Number three, the teaching of false doctrine. If a person is in a position of influence within a church and they are teaching stuff that is absolutely anti-biblical and they continue to spread that false gospel, that has to be addressed. And if it is not addressed, then it could lead to destructive, destructive things happening and it adversely affect the whole body. And then lastly, a person who professes faith but lives in sin without 
continuous life of sin without repentance. This is the case of 1 Corinthians 5. Remember, it was addressed, it was consistent, it was unrepentant, everybody knew about it, it was public, it was out for everybody to see, and that person continues to not acknowledge their sin and calling it what it is in that way. But we are to be repentant of our sin in order to be restored to God and others. Look at verse 6. Now that I've laid out the treatment plan for you, we're going to pick up the speed and we're going to talk a little bit about the effect of the disease. What happens if we don't address it? What happens if we don't address it? Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you know, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are really unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Paul, as a good preacher, is given an example. And he's given the example that all his listeners would know and understand. Therefore, let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, if any of y'all are bakers in here, how many bakers we got in the the house today? So, uh, yes, Jody Malloy, that's you. So... Uh, leaven is like yeast, and anybody who bakes knows that a little goes a long way, and it infects the whole entire thing in which it's part of, all right? It can make the bread rise a whole lot. Now, Paul is using this example of, of unrepentant sin being like leaven that affects and changes the whole batch of dough. I've already mentioned this before, but here's a very simple principle for you in the Christian life. Your sin never just affects you. Never. Never, ever, ever. Because you don't live on an island to yourself. You don't live in a vacuum. God created you as a relational being. You have relational connections and influences. So your sin never just affects you. We understand this in interpersonal relationships within our families and all those different things. We know how the sin and decisions of people that are made, no matter how much you try to encourage them, have an impact on you. And same thing with us when we make those bad decisions. Sin's like a grenade. It blows up, shrapnel goes everywhere, and it hits everybody within the radius, within the blast zone. So a lot of times we in the blast zone, right? So leavened bread is the idea of what happened in Passover. There was a feast of unleavened bread when all the leaven was removed from the house as a symbolic reminder of the Israelites' quick departure from Egypt They did not have time for the bread to rise. And Paul is linking that idea to saying malice and evil and all these different things are like leaven. You understood what leaven was in the Old Testament. You understand why this festival takes place. Same thing when it comes to your personal life. If not, it's going to affect the whole. The last thing is if we get diagnosed and we realize we need to have surgery, where are we going to have the procedure at? Verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter, or the greedy swindlers or idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world, or the greedy, or swindlers and idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother and he is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, is an idolater, a reviler, a drunker, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Notice the distinction that Paul makes. Paul says, I'm not talking about people who do things that are ungodly, who are not godly people. That's what verse 9 and 10 says. He says, I'm not talking about those people that are out in the world that he specifically says, who are idolaters, swindlers, all these different things. He says, but I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother. He's saying, not those people out there, in here. I'm talking about these people. I'm talking about the church folk. I'm not talking about those people. Unfortunately, the reason why, and rightly so, that the unbelieving world has often cast this idea toward Christians is because we are so busy looking at them. The church has been so busy looking at the outside world and saying, they should know better. They've been so busy looking at the outside world and saying, well, you know, expecting them to live according to a standard that they are humanly impossible to be able to live by. An unbeliever cannot live as a godly saint. It's against their human nature. Their nature has not been redeemed. They're dead in their trespassing and sin. A sinner is going to sin. That's all they can do. 
And yet we always fixate on the sinner in this way. We fixate like, okay, well, that's not the way that they were raised. They should know better. It doesn't matter if a person was raised in a Christian household. If that person has not bowed their knee to Jesus, they are unregenerate, unrepentant. They're a sinner. And all they're going to do is sin. Somehow we have the expectation that a person who doesn't know Christ should actually live like Christ. That's why the outside world calls us judgmental, because we are in that sense. Now, that doesn't mean that if we have a personal conversation with somebody, that's why I said accountability happens in relationships, and that's why the gospel happens in the context of relationships, and that's why we talk about having a relationship with Jesus, right? That doesn't mean that obviously the gospel by itself is confrontational in nature, because it says God demands this, God died for sin, you need to change. So in that way, it's confrontational. However, you're not doing the judging. God is. You're pointing them to the word. The word of God is what is bringing conviction. The word of God is what is bringing sin to light. That's why Paul says that the law essentially is like our schoolmaster to us. So that way we understand our sin. We only under, un, understand what sin is and its need for redemption when we understand it in light of the way God has defined it. But God does the judging, not you. Unfortunately, I am totally guilty of this. This has happened to me before. And I always ask God to check my heart about this. Sometimes I have an attitude toward an unbeliever though. I have an attitude toward them like somehow you should just get this and, you know, you should do different. You should be better. That ain't the way your mama raised you. You understand what I'm saying? And you understand the difference that Paul is making? But unfortunately, we're pointing the finger always at the outside world and wondering why they don't come to Jesus. We're pointing our finger at the outside world and somehow just thinking when open the doors to the church, they're going to come in. And the reason why they're calling us judgmental and critical is because we've been pointing the outside, been pointing the finger. And just and then all of a sudden we're just saying, oh, yeah, well, then you can come to our turf. Why are they going to want to come when all you've been doing is this? Remember, there's four more looking back at you or something like they say. Verse, thir- uh, verse 12 and 13. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? That literally should be your heart. You should highlight this verse. What do I have to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. God's the one, but listen to what he says. You Purge the evil person from among you. Get the leaven out. You do that in your context. Stop worrying about them. Worry about you first. Ladies and gentlemen, the unbelieving world is looking at us, and they have a right to point the finger back at us. And they're pointing the finger back at us because of things that are happening that they are seeing. And unfortunately, the body of Christ is a worldwide body, and everybody who names the name of Christian is lumped together and as we should be in that sense, and they're judging us, rightly so, because we've been telling them for years that they need to do this, they need to do that, and yet we're not even dealing with issues like what happened with uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and all the sexual immorality and, and the inappropriate relationships that are happening inside of churches, and that has been happening in the Catholic Church for years. They have a right to point the finger at us because we haven't been dealing with it. And yet we're trying to point the finger at them saying, come to, you know, come to know this Jesus and we have not exactly been a good representation of him, unfortunately. Keep it in house, guys. Judgment begins with us in God's house first. Surgery takes place inside of a hospital, not out on the street. The perception of the world is that Christians are judgmental comes to, down to the fact that we are too busy trying to clean house outside rather than cleaning it inside first. Let's summarize this for you. We talked about accountability is necessary for spiritual health of individuals and the church as a whole. There is a way in which God laid out this accountability to be able to take place. Brothers and sisters, iron is supposed to sharpen iron. We are supposed to uh, call our brothers and sisters to be able to encourage them spiritually, as it said in Galatians 6.1, and to bring them back to spiritual health. 
We talked about the diagnosis of sin, and sin is like cancer spreading to everything if it's not dealt with. The treatment, we talked about laying out the treatment from you according to Matthew 18 and also according to this passage. We talked about the effects of the disease, how sin spreads, and it can spread throughout the hospital. It needs to be quarantined. It needs to be cut off. And if it's not cut off, then it can have detrimental effects to the body of Christ. And it will have detrimental effects in your own personal life if you don't deal with it either. Sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go. And then all of a sudden, you'll be down the line and be like, how the heck did I get here? You ever had that happen before? You've fallen into a bad trap of the enemy and then asked yourself, how the heck did I get here? And then lastly, surgeries performed at the hospital, in the church, with a hospital. It's not on the street. The church is a hospital, and we need to treat our own, and we need to be the ones who are treating ourselves first before we worry about trying to heal the outside world in that way. We can't just be pointing the finger. So how can we deal with this? I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward, and we're going to pray. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is ask God to break your heart over sin. Our hearts should be broken when our relationship with God is fractured. When sin is causing distance and friction in our relationship with God and it is separating us, it should break our hearts. And if you are here today under the sound of my voice and you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's what Easter is all about, right? And Easter is all about the fact that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again. And... Our sin is the, the reason why the Savior needed to die. So you have to deal with your sin personally first. You're never going to change. No matter how much you try, you're not going to change what is inside of you by your nature until God resurrects you and he makes you into a new creation. And then lastly, we need to deal with sin personally and corporately. Don't let it fester. Don't let it grow. Cut it off at the root. You'll be more healthy for it, and the body of Christ will be more healthy for it as well. God is concerned about the health of his church. That means you personally. That also means corporately. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I just pray that, that you will give us the grace, the strength. I thank you that the church is a hospital. That, Lord, that all who are sick are able to come and to receive treatment. I thank you, Lord, that we can come in our brokenness and we can come just as we are, as we often say. That's so true. But Lord, you don't leave us in that state. What would it be like for us to walk into a hospital and then walk back out in the same exact condition? The whole goal is that we would be nursed back to health. And Lord, I thank you that the church is a place that you have set up parameters where that can take place. And unfortunately, we have not always done it right. Sometimes we're so fixated upon what goes on outside, Lord, and we have wrongfully been so critical and not done a personal self-inspection and evaluation. And we've allowed things to go on even within our own context, Lord, that probably shouldn't have. But Lord, even accountability is in the context of relationships, and it's done to bring about restoration. Even as Paul encouraged and walked out the Corinthians through this, Lord, and encouraged them to receive this brother back into the fold because repentance that took place and restoration could then come. Lord, that doesn't mean that these conversations or these things are easy, but Lord, they're necessary for personal health, spiritual health, and for the health of your church. And you are jealously protective of her.